Hey gang, welcome to Time in the Market, the investing channel with a long-term focus. Taking a look at Nebius, the stock dipped a little bit after the earnings release this morning, but is now in the positives. This is my number one position, so keep that in mind. I've made a couple of videos about this stock already. I will link those down below if you want a deeper dive into what the company does. And this video will be purely about the earnings that they released today. And there's mostly positives here, a couple of negatives. I think that's why the stock was down a little bit initially. They missed on the top line revenue of 146 for Q3 versus something like 155 expected. Not a huge deal, very much a bottleneck problem. They are building out a ton of capacity and it's just when that capacity comes online that's going to drive when the revenue really starts ticking up. They're still guiding for close to 1.1 billion in ARR by the end of the year. The Microsoft deal starts to kick in in Q four they've already delivered the first tranche of that right now so some of that revenue is going to start flowing in in terms of ARR and revenue and then I think the same happens for Meta although they're starting to build out that capacity and that deal which is a new deal by the way three billion dollars over five years kicks in early 2026 so a lot of that will be showing up in the revenue then as well so the fact that they missed revenues for Q3 tightened their guidance for 2025 not a huge deal in my mind what is a huge deal is that they're basically saying we have so much demand for our product, for the AI infrastructure that we're building out, that we have to turn away customers. The new meta deal, three billion over five years, that's the most they could provide within that time frame because of the limitations around securing land, building data centers, putting GPUs in those data centers. And that is certainly a good problem to have. And hopefully that continues well into the future. And one of the things that that leads to, as you look at the 2026 guidance that they're starting to give, and that guidance is freaking impressive. They're basically saying that by the end of 2026, their annualized run rate revenue at year end is going to be seven to nine billion. Again, that means that that's the last month of revenue multiplied by 12. So you're saying that by the end of 2026, you're going to have six to 700 million a month in revenue flowing into this business. You can see the kind of growth that you're seeing here driven by those new contracts, driven by the capacity expansion that they're having. You look at the contracted power that they have. Obviously they need power to run all these data centers. You are looking at a previously announced plan of one gigawatt of energy by the end of 2026. Now they're aiming for two and a half gigawatts of energy by 2026, which is a big expansion. Then the connected power, so they're gonna have the capacity to have 2.5 gigawatts of connected power, but obviously that's limited by how fast they can build out these data centers, get these GPUs in place, get them up and running and sell them. They're moving from 220 megawatts of connected power by 2025 to almost a gigawatt of connected power by 2026. And really that's what you're excited about as an investor in Nebius, again, which I am. You're excited about the growth potential that this company has. You can look at it from the perspective of, hey, this is half a billion dollars in actual revenue in 25. You're paying what? A 60X multiple to sales based on today's price or something like that. Yes, that's expensive, but this is a company that's probably going to grow 5x in terms of revenue into 2025 because of the timing of when these deals come online, when the capacity comes online. And then going into 27 is probably going to grow another 3 to 4x in terms of revenue. ARR is going to go 7x by end of year 25 into end of year 26. That's pretty impressive growth. And a lot of that is driven by the fact that any capacity that comes online, it's sold out immediately. You look at the Meta deal, it could have been bigger if they had the capacity to do it. That means that Meta may come back later and say, hey, we have additional demand that's out there. We know you just brought on additional capacity. We know you're building stuff out, give it to us. And if not, some other players will be there as well because they know that they have deals that they're turning away right now that will hopefully come back as this capacity comes online. And that is really the bottleneck here is the capacity. And the reality is that this isn't cheap to bring online. You're talking about billions and billions of dollars that this is going to cost to get to the expected annualized run rate revenue by the end of 26 and even more to get even higher in 27. They're raising their CapEx expenditures for 2025 from $2 billion all the way up to $5 billion. That's not very exciting for investors. That's a big cash burn. They've secured funding for that. They've 
raised money through convertible notes. They did an equity offering in September. There's an additional at the market equity offering available to them right now. That doesn't mean they're issuing shares, but they have the ability to issue an additional 25 million shares where that today prices is close to $3 billion in additional funding they could get. But it is dilutive. They talked about how they want to maintain flexibility around raising money, but don't want to be too dilutive to investors. But the reality is they will be dilutive. They will have to raise debt because this is going to cost tens of billions of dollars to get this business to where it needs to be in the coming years. And they do talk about their adjusted EBITDA margins. But when you think about a company like this one, EBITDA margin is absolute nonsense in my mind. This is removing depreciation, amortization, interest taxes, all of that stuff. This is a business that has huge depreciation, amortization costs. Those are real costs. They're going to have to replace these GPUs every four to five to six years, however long. These data centers are not a forever thing. They're going to need to be upgraded over and over and over. There's going to be continual build out to provide capacity. And that is going to mean that this is going to be a free cash flow burning business for years and years and years. And you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with the volatility that comes with that as an investor. And the one thing I really like about Nebius is that it isn't just a full out AI infrastructure play. Yes, that is a huge part of their business, but they're using a lot of this money, a lot of the deals and the money coming in from Microsoft and Meta as financial accelerators to build their own AI cloud business a software layer on top of the infrastructure. They've launched products like AI Cloud 3.0 Aether, which is an enterprise ready cloud platform that will allow organizations to do a variety of things and run critical AI workloads on their own software. There's Nebius Token Factory, which is a production scale inference platform. And a lot of these things are attractive, not really the hyperscalers who have their own stuff that does that, but some of these smaller AI startups like Black Forest Labs, Cursor, even players like Shopify and World Labs that are bigger scale players that are customers of theirs. And that is a differentiator for a company like Nebius because at the end of the day, right now, the supply demand curve really favors the suppliers, right? The demand is huge. The supply is limited. The GPU compute hour costs are high and that really benefits Nebius. What happens when supply starts to catch up to demand? You have to have a differentiator as a company to really make yourself stand out. And I think what they're doing, the engineering team they have, gives them that differentiating power, which is why I like the stock over some others in this Neo Cloud space. And then beyond the Nebius core business, A infrastructure, they have other businesses. They have an autonomous vehicle business, AV Ride, which just got a strategic investment slash partnership from Uber. So they still own a good portion of that. But Uber is obviously a player. They're launching robo taxis in Dallas. They have a bunch of robot delivery things going on. There's a Triple Ten, which is an ad uh, education tech platform, which is growing 2x year over year in terms of revenue. They have equity stakes in ClickHouse. They own about 25, 28% of that. They had a valuation of 6.3 billion on that company, which may go publicly in the future, which is another way for them to raise money potentially. Then they have a data solutions business, which is backed by Bezos Expeditions. They own that fully. They kind of spun it off to Bezos Expeditions, retaining a majority ownership, but not voting stake in that. So these are additional things you get on top of this infrastructure business, which I think are nice additives, but not something I depend on as far as making this a worthy investment. However, they're nice to have and add an additional thing to the top of the investment puzzle. So how do you value this sucker? And disclaimer, this video is purely for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. It is not investment advice. I will say that if you're doing a free cash flow analysis at this point for a company like this, you're making stuff up. So keep that in mind. I'm making stuff up. If you want to play around with this spreadsheet, hit file, make a copy. There will be a link to this in the description down below. We know what 25 is going to look like. You have half a billion in revenue, probably negative 5 billion in free cash flow. 26 is a question mark. They say they're going to give guidance for 2026 revenue next earnings release. But they also mentioned that a lot of the Microsoft deal is going to float into the back end of 26. When you think about that seven to nine billion in ARR by the end of 2026, a lot of that won't impact 2026 as a whole. So early part of 26, you probably don't have anywhere close to that in ARR. As you approach the latter part of 2026, you're at 7 billion, but maybe a month of that impacts 2026 as a whole. So you're talking about maybe 550% growth, getting to 3, 
3.4 billion dollars in revenue maybe a bit higher maybe i'm conservative but that also comes with the need for additional expansion so you've got 5 billion in 25 maybe 10 billion in cash burn in 26 is that too much i think it's a reasonable assumption that means that by 27 a lot of that arr floats into 27 maybe i'm too conservative here but i have 180 percent growth and additional eight to nine billion in free cash flow burn growing 60% into 28, 40% into 29. They really talked about how if you have 2.5 gigawatts of contracted power, if the goal is to have all of that into connected power based on current revenue norms, you're talking about 20 billion in revenue easy, getting there by 2029 seems reasonable to me. Maybe I'm off on the various years and when it happens, maybe growth is faster, but that's kind of my assumption around where this company can go from here in terms of growth. And you have to remember, a lot of that does kind of depend on the demand supply curve remaining relatively static. As a lot of the supply comes on, demand has to be there to take it, right? That's how they're going to grow. If the demand starts to fall off and the supply keeps coming online, pricing starts to drop for a company like Nebius, they have to do other things. Maybe the growth won't be there. Maybe these investments they're making won't pay off. So that's a huge risk you're taking as an investor here. The reality is by 2029, they are not going to be cash flow positive. They're probably still going to be burning five to six to $7 billion. They have to raise that money somehow. Right now they have, let's say $4.3 billion in cash on their balance sheet. If they are wanting to grow at this pace, they're going to have to do what Core Reef is doing. They're going to have to deploy a ton of cash. I have them deploying including this year, $30 billion in CapEx and negative free cash flow to get to that $20 billion revenue range. That means more dilution, more debt being raised, selling off some of their equity stakes. And that's really the reality you have to face as an investor here. They already raised additional money via an equity raise. They have this at the market offering of 25 million shares. More of that is coming. I think you're going to be diluted pretty heavily in the next couple of years to fund this growth. And you have to be okay with that as an investor. And you're also going to have debt on top of that. People say, hey, look at Core Reef's balance sheet. It sucks. Well, that's because Core Reef is already way ahead of the growth curve from where Nebius is. Nebius is going to have to do the same thing. They're going to have to raise a bunch of debt. They can probably get decent rates because of their contracts with Microsoft and Meta, etc. But the debt is going to happen. That's just reality to grow this business. So you have some dilution here, some stock-based compensation, negative free cash flow. That's the reality. The buyback yield is going to be negative. There's going to be debt, et cetera. As far as 2029 goes, like I said, I don't think they're going to be free cash flow positive, but just for the sake of valuation here, I put a 10% free cash flow margin. When this company gets more mature, you know, they're aiming for, let's say, a 30% EBITDA margin, like some of the hyperscalers. But in order to do that, you probably have to start reaching 30, 40, 50 billion dollars in annual revenue. Until then, you're burning free cash flow. When you look at Google Cloud, Google Cloud is now just starting to be a addition to Google's operating income. And that's a $50 billion business. Before then, it wasn't all that positive in terms of income. I think that's the same for Nebius. They're going to be burning free cash flow. Yes, they're going to have adjusted EBITDA that's positive, but operating income is going to be negative. Free cash flow is going to be negative. So just as a fun exercise here, I put a 10% free cash flow margin. Let's say they hit a 20% EBITDA margin. Half of that converts to free cash flow. Eventually, once they start cutting back on capacity expansion, once they start actually having the revenue to support that without burning free cash flow, um, that may happen in 29, might happen a bit later. But if you do that, a company growing at 40%, let's say you give it a 3% free cash flow yield, you're talking about a $70 billion to $100 billion market cap company by then, gets you to a fair, fair value of 138 bucks. I don't know why I have $100 here, but it's trading above that right now. At the end of the day, somebody asked me in another video, do I think this is a company that can reach $100 billion? Totally. I think it can. I think if the long-term goal is a 30% EBITDA margin, that get, maybe gets you to a 20% free cash flow margin. You're talking about a hundred to $200 billion company returns anywhere from, what's it trading at right now? $113, you know, 26% to 47%, a stock price that's in the 360 to $770 range, even including the $16 billion in dilution that they're going to have, assuming the valuation stays the same. That's the potential this company has. That's why you invest in it. What's the risk with this company? The risk is that this could be all smoke and mirrors. This is a company that is spending so much money on capacity for demand that exists currently, 
but could fall off in three to four to five years. That's the risk you're taking, right? You need that demand to exist when this company is mature so that it can actually start making money, paying down the debt and buying back the shares that it issued in order to grow. That's the risk. That's the reality. Right now, this is a potential company. And I think the potential is amazing. I think this is a potential for, you know, 30 to 40 to 50% annual returns, but it also has the potential if the market takes a turn for a negative, takes a, a more negative look at overall risk assets. This is a very risky asset, right? This is a company that could be trading at $50 tomorrow if things take a swing for the worst, if the economy starts moving in the wrong direction, if um, people are worried about this, that, and the other, if the AI trade falls off a little bit, this is very much tied to the AI trade. So keep that in mind. There's risk here. For me, the risk is worth it, but I am also aware of the risk. This was a position that I started at 5% of my portfolio. It grew all the way to 30% of my portfolio when I was trading on 130 bucks, and I sold off a fourth of my position. So now my position is 75% of what it was because I wanted to take some of that risk off. I was, you know, at a 500% return. There's no shame in shelling at a 500% return, but I wanted to keep a good portion of this company. This is still 17 to 18% of my active portfolio. I believe in this company. I think these earnings are a good sign of things to come and a sign that they're moving in the right direction, but I'm also aware of the risk that exists with this company. So that's my take on Nebius love what they're doing, love what they're, where they're heading, but I'm crystal clear about what this stock could do because it's a very risky asset. If you're in a risk on market, like we are right now, things are looking great. If you move into a risk off market, these companies that are still growing um, could see a 50% haircut pretty quickly. So that's my take on it. What do you think? Do you like Nebius? Do you agree with me on anything? Have I missed anything? Do you disagree with me on anything? Leave a comment down below. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel. I do videos like this relatively often, but not consistently. My bad. Uh, otherwise, like the video and all of that good stuff. Thanks for watching. Bye.